sixth episode of Game of Thrones, promptly titled A Golden Crown, is another episode that is mostly great source material adaptation. So let's get into it. So the intro of this episode starts with Ned waking up from his coma after the hard written battle with Jamie Lannister and getting speared in the back of the knee. So now, this is, I would say, the worst differentiation from show to book story in that in the books, before Ned wakes up, he actually has a dream about the war with the Targaryens and more specifically going to save his sister Lyanna. And then he's rudely interrupted by Grand Maester Pycelle and he gets woken up. Now, the show just starts the episode off with Ned waking up from his coma and it's Robert and Cersei in his room. And in which case, the scene plays out completely the same as the book story from there on out where Robert is basically yelling at Ned about everything that's transpired, particularly with Catelyn imprisoning Tyrion and the whole arguing with the Lannisters and Stark v. Lannisters, as well as Cersei mocking even Robert and Robert backhanding Cersei. And all of this is because Robert still has immense love for Ned as a best friend and as Hand of the King. And he swears to Ned if he yanks the Hand of the King symbol off his uh, chest again, he'll, he'll make Jamie wear the damn thing. So now we go from that <coughs> to another Danny fire immunity scene, which is Danny glorifying her dragon eggs again that are in the fire pit. And for some reason, she just volunteers to pick one up until one of her handmaids comes and sees and they, they think that she's hurting herself. So they steal the dragon egg from her hand, but the dragon egg actually hurts her hands, not Danny's. And Danny realizes that. So that's another scene that shows off Danny's immunity to fire because she's a Targaryen. So now we go to Winterfell and Bran has a dream about a three-eyed crow. In the show, it's a three-eyed crow. In the book, it's a three-eyed raven. That's really the only differentiation to this scene. But <clears throat> then we fast forward. Hodor brings in the horse straddle. So we fast forward to Bran and Rob riding in the forests on horseback. Now, there is a slight differentiation between book and show story with this scene where the book story, Rob actually goes off to find the dead animal that their direwolves found and killed and leaves Bran alone. In the show, Bran actually wanders off from Rob and Theon when Rob and Theon are having a conversation. I prefer the show scene just because why would why would a brother's lord just run away from his little brother when he's a cripple? It never really made sense to me. So I do prefer the show's version better, but after this differentiation, it's all the same. Bran ends up getting in, intruded by Osha and uh invaders that have abandoned their black cloaks from the wall and this all plays out basically the exact same way between book and show story so now we fast forward to Tyrion who's locked away in the dungeon in the Vale and he's basically recounting his time here and he is contemplating suicide just jumping off the wall into the forest miles down. Now we go into Arya and Sirio Farrell having a conversation. It's basically just a catching up conversation in Arya's feelings. That's, it's a great scene, it's a great conversation, but that's really ultimately all that this conversation is about. So now we go back to Danny and she's going through a Kalasar ritual. She has to eat a horse's heart. And I guess that just signifies if she keeps the heart down, that the baby growing inside of her is going to be the strongest in the world of 
Kalasar. And at the same time, we get monologues between Jorah and Viserys, basically an explanation about this whole ritual, and Viserys mocking Danny more, making him look more like a fucking pure bad guy. Now, we get the very first show exclusive scene in the episode, which is right after this ritual, Jorah confronts Viserys, who is just sneakily trying to steal away the dragon's eggs, and Jorah basically threatens him and makes him relieve the eggs from his palms, and Jorah lets him leave. So, now we go back to Tyrion back in the dungeon. <clears throat> he calls out Mord again, and he is explaining to Mord the likes of being in the presence of a Lannister, how the Lannisters are the richest and wealthiest of all the land, and all Mord has to do is send Tyrion to Liza Aaron to confess his crimes, and Mord will be the richest he's ever been in his entire life. So we go from that scene to Tyrion and Lysa having a conversation, and there's a little differentiation in this scene from the show to the book. So the book has a couple of confessions from Tyrion, but the show goes full out comedic effort. And Tyrion confesses basically all of his life crimes, and they're all so fun. They're funny, they're fun, they're entertaining, they're very well written even. And this leads Lysa to getting pissed off at him, and Catelyn making him have to confess to the murder of Jon Arryn and the conspiring of the murder of her son, to which Tyrion explains that he is being falsely accused for both, and he can't exactly confess to crimes that he had no part in. So now after this scene, we get a show-exclusive scene, which is Robert and company having their little hunt in the forest for the wild boar and the like for the feasts. And Robert is going through a monologue, but is cut off by Renly, basically explaining how how much of a shit king Robert's been compared to the great likes of himself, Renly Baratheon. And this scene ends with Robert's squire, Lancel Lannister, offering Robert some more wine from his pouch. And it may not seem important, it may seem just like another squire duty, but this comes into play later on in the series. So now we go to Ned in King's Landing, in the throne room, basically residing as king while Robert is gone. And this scene is all about Ned listening to pleas. And then he comes to the realization that the pleas are actually Gregor Clegane, the mountain, who has been tasked from Tywin Lannister to basically ransack all of all of these, these villages and towns that are in the name of Catelyn Tully. And the reason why is because Tywin has found out that Catelyn has taken the imp, his son, prisoner. So this scene concludes with Ned basically banishing Gregor's name out of the entire kingdom and sentencing Beric Dondarrion to rid the world of Gregor Clegane. He sends him out to murder him. And... All of this is because Gregor had no per actual permission to do any of this. So after this scene, and Littlefinger's a little boasting to Ned's uh, choices, and whether it, they be good or bad, they were still noble choices. So now we go back to the Vale, and I should mention, because I missed it, uh, Tyrion explained he wanted a trial by combat to prove his innocence. In the book story, there's a little more conversation about Tyrion waiting for his brother Jaime to be summoned to the Vale, and Lysa denies that. So, here's where the book and show are the same. Tyrion explains he needs, he needs a fighter, in which everybody laughs in his face, and Bronn, the South Sword, ends up chiming in, saying he wants to be the Dwarf's swordsman. Now... A little exposition into this scene that the book story tells a lot better of. So, more stripped scenes from the show that are in the book story. So, before 
Catelyn and them ever even made it to the Vale when they were still on the King's Road, there were multiple, multiple scenes of Bronn and Tyrion having good jests, good conversations with each other that really built up their chemistry. Whereas the show just kind of made it Bronn's a sellsword just in their company. So there's the little differentiation in that storyline. So now, <clears throat> Vardis and Bronn fight. And this fight is basically the exact same from book to, to show, where it shows off Vardis fighting very honorably, but Bronn is very sneaky because he's a sellsword, and he knows how to put a, an actual knight on the ground. And so Bronn ends up being victorious in very sneaky ways, and this leads Tyrion to winning and leaving and also paying Mord, as he promised. Now we go to Sansa basically randomly being bitchy to their Septim Ordain, basically just being a spoiled teenager at this point, and this leads into Joffrey entering the room, and this is supposed to be a scene where Joffrey is showing morally good character development, but obviously nobody buys it except Sansa. He offers Sansa a necklace, apologizes for everything that's happened, and she kisses his, her betrothed. Supposed to be a nice sweet scene. I, I, alike everybody else in the world, we have never bought this from Joffrey. So now we get another show exclusive scene, and this is Theon riding back to Winterfell, and he sees Ross on one of the carts leaving Winterfell, and this is not really a necessary scene, it's more so just more character development for Ross because she ends up being a little more important later on in the series elsewhere. So we get that scene. Now we have Ned who has a conversation with Arya and Sansa about how times are becoming way too dangerous in King's Landing. He is sending them back to Winterfell to which they both protest against Arya protesting she wants to bring Syria Pharrell back with them. Sansa making jests about that. But more so Sansa is protesting against it because she's finally feeling more love towards Joffrey again. And this leads into a, a Sansa monologue about the Baratheon lineage, which phew, completely opens up Ned's whole entire mind. And he realizes the deep dark secret. So this leads Ned to going back to the Westeros family lineage history book, and he's reading through all of the Baratheon lineage, more specifically, every single Baratheon's hair color. And it goes all the way to Robert Baratheon. They've all had black of hair. And then we go from that to Joffrey and Tommen and them, who have gold of hair. And this is a scene where Ned finally fully realizes the deep dark secret. The show didn't spoil it yet, I won't either. Now, the end scene of this episode is where the title comes into play. This is the Golden Crown scene. This is back with Danny and Viserys and Jorah and Khal Drogo. So, to preface this scene as well, before they ever made it to Vase Dothrak in the book, what happens is Khal Drogo and, and his company, they're getting irritated with Viserys and just him being a pretentious snob to everybody. So they crown Viserys with a cart for the, the ride to Vase Dothrak. Viserys accepts it actually humbly. He, he treats it as a badge of honor because he sees it as they're looking at him kingly. Whereas Khal Drogo and co., that's actually their little ritual that shows that he's the beggar king. He's, he's the runt of the litter. So it's actually an insult. But now that is book story exclusive only. So now after that, after the horse heart ritual, we get the golden crown, which is Viserys drunkenly going in to Vase Dothrak and threatening everybody. He, he finally wants his crown. He finally wants his kingdom, he, he wants his, his guardsmen, everything. So, in Vase Dothrak, a place where there is no violence to be had, he pulls out his sword and threatens Danny's, Danny and, his ba and their baby's life, 
and Khal Drogo agrees to finally give Viserys everything that he's won, the golden crown. So this ends with Viserys accepting and Khal Drogo obviously going back on his word, kind of. Whereas Khal Drogo's henchmen break Viserys' arms and Khal Drogo pours molten gold all over Viserys' head, thereby giving him his own golden crown. Now, this is an important scene because all the references, the scene references thus far with Danny and being immune to fire, she lets all of this happen because she wants to witness it. She wanted to see if Viserys was immune to fire, which he wasn't. The golden crown was thrown on his head and he immediately dies after swaths of screaming. So this concludes with Danny realizing both in book and show that Viserys was never a true Targaryen, but she is. So this is the actual start of Danny's storyline without Viserys. Now overall for me, A Golden Crown, Episode 6 of Game of Thrones, I think it's a phenomenally told episode. There are bits and pieces stripped out from the book, but really they were scenes that were before this episode's story, so I'll kind of just let that go. So overall for me, this is an excellent, masterfully done episode. Mostly extremely accurate to the book material that it shows up in the episode. So I'd have to give a Golden Crown Episode 6 a 10 out of 10. Thank you.